Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. As part of being the Chief Financial Officer of Amnesty International, it also meant I became Treasurer of Concerts for Human Rights. So the 501c3 organization that Bruce and Sting and Peter Gabriel, and I got to meet all those guys. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. That clip was from Stephen King in Houston, Texas. Stephen has had an amazing career, and you'll be able to tell from his energy that he really has enjoyed the journey. In this episode, you're going to hear everything from being influenced by his dad to look into accounting in the first place, to being a leader with Amnesty International during their high growth period, to being a repeat Inc. 500 speaker, and then to founding Growth Force, his financial systems optimization company there in Houston, Texas. I think you can safely describe Stephen's career as a wild ride, but definitely a fun and very successful one. You can find out more about his company at growthforce.com. Speaking of websites, if you find this episode interesting, please visit us at whereaccountantsgo.com to subscribe to the podcast, or you can do so on your favorite podcast app as well, of course. Also, we have a job board for the Texas area and links to all the certifications in the accounting world as well. That site is www.whereaccountantsgo.com. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Stephen King of Growth Force in Houston, Texas. Well, hello, Stephen. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Wonderful. Well, for our audience, we have Stephen King on the line with us today, and he's highly active there in Houston, Texas, in the accounting community. He came referred to us, actually, from some of our contacts in that area, and he's had a very interesting career path. His background covers Big Four experience industry experience, actually, with Amnesty International. He's raised money with venture capitalist firms, and he's grown outsourced accounting service firms. So this is going to be a very interesting story. We have a lot of ground to cover, and that's not even Mm. touching personal interest or volunteer interest. (laughs) Stephen, I want to make sure we start at the beginning because I always like to get an idea of how someone got started. What led you to accounting as a possible career in the first place? I am an accountant because my dad was an accountant. And I was a, what I didn't know it at the time, but I was a bookkeeper for him. I just thought of it as indentured servitude as, you know, son of an Irish immigrant. Everybody's going to carry their weight. So I was in the basement of our house in Flushing, Queens in the early 70s as a 10 and 12 year older adding up outstanding checks so he could do the bank reconciliation. I didn't know it at the time, but he had a little tax practice that he did at night. He was an auditor for Chrysler, and he was a controller for a car dealer. He's actually an amazing small business American success story himself. Came off the boat from Ireland without a high school degree. Got a job selling in retail, said, oh, that's not for me. Went to night school and high school and college, Baruch University. UCLA, we call it, the university on the corner of Lexington Avenue. (laughs) And he got an accounting degree, went to work for General Motors in the stock transfer department and worked his way up to now. He, my brother actually runs him, but he started a series of car dealers in Long Island. He was a controller in a car dealer industry and the owner died and General Motors put him in Jimmy O'Rourke. He created King O'Rourke Cadillac in Smithtown, Long Island. So my dad was a businessman and an accountant and he made money on the side like so many accountants do. And I was helping him. Then by 1975, he bought a Texas instrument calculator that could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And it printed out what you did so I could give him a tape total and can key in the outstanding checks. And that changed my job. When I was graduating high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I sat at the table, you know, ruminating. And my dad said, look, you should be an accountant. Why? Everybody needs an accountant. It doesn't matter what industry you want to be a rock and roll accountant. You can be a rock and roll accountant. 
And I said to myself, that's what I want to be, a rock and roll accountant. And I went to Pace University. I took accounting in high school, which I think is absolutely critical. If there's one takeaway here was get honors accounting in your high school. We did it at Kingwood High School. Mark, there are 250 students signed up for Honors Accounting 1 and Honors Accounting 2 in Kingwood High School alone. We had 19 accounting students before we got it eligible for honors in Texas. And anybody can do that. That's a different podcast, I guess. But anyway, after taking that high school accounting course, I said, okay, yep, I want to get a job. Everybody needs an accountant. I'll always be able to get a job and I can do it in any city I want. He also told me, he said, if you work in a big business, and you're up for a promotion against somebody else, if you know how to read a P&L and understand the impact on the bottom line, you're much more valuable to the company because accounting is the language of business. And that stuck with me my whole life. I didn't think I'd be doing what I'm doing right now, but I saw accounting as an enabler to learn how to help businesses make more money. So that's how I got started. So you not only got the accounting bug from your dad, you also got the entrepreneurial bug from him as <laughs> yeah, I guess well. so, yeah. I never thought about that. It's true. Thank you for that, Mark. <laughs> no problem. That's interesting. So I know you went to work at EY eventually. Did you get out of college and continue working with your father? Or did No, you just... no. Okay. I am the oldest son, and I am the independent streak. And so, you know, I wanted to do it on my own. I'm the only one in the family who never worked in the car business. And I missed that, I have to say. But I got to Pace, and I you know, worked on Wall Street in a check processing department for Morgan Guarantee Bank. And I said, I need to find out if I like accounting. So in my sophomore year, I got a job at a CPA firm in Midtown Manhattan called Rose, Feldman, Raiden, Pavone, and Skian. Art Raiden was a legend in New York, and I was lucky to be in the firm. And I got that job in the, like, you know, the middle of my sophomore year, and I stayed three years. And in, in 1979, I was 19 years old, they put an Apple II PC on my desk, and a computer junkie was born. They literally, literally bought the book. Uh, Joe Rose, the son, was going off to Cornell. It was the first college to require freshmen to have a computer. He bought one for his son. He bought one for the firm. And when it showed up at the front door, it must have cost a lot of money because our rating said, God, Joe, give that to the college kid. Let him figure out what we're going to do with it. So this is a clean show. Otherwise, I would tell you what he really said. So I, I inherited this machine and I learned how to program in DOS from Joe Rose's son and do batch files. And then we use VisiCalc to eliminate the job of the statistical typist. It was great. She didn't want to, she had this giant typewriter that she would type reports, you know, 16 column wide reports. And so we automated that and we had to get permission from the client. In writing, we had to get a letter that said they give us permission to put their data into a computer. <laughs> Is that interesting? Just a straight desktop, no internet, of course. I left there and I went to the Ernst & Young and my clients started calling saying, hey, what do you mean you're leaving? Can you stay with us? And I was like, I went to the partner. I went to Art Ray and I said, hey, can I get these bookkeeping clients? I think I can do it nights and weekends and my friends are accountants. And he said, mazel tov. Godspeed. We don't want to do bookkeeping. Huh. We want to do audits. We want to do tax returns. We want to be trusted business advisors. That's my best art rating imitation. Though. So <laughs> I started a little bookkeeping on the side and just people who had become friends, owners, business owners who become friends, you know, half a dozen small businesses and myself and my two college movies who live with me in Hoboken did the write-up work, did the compilation, did the tax returns, started a little thing. I went off to Ernst & Young as an intern. I didn't want to graduate. I didn't want to enter the real world. So I took a year, gap year, basically, and did that as an internship at Ernst & Young. And they liked my technology experience, which was, you know, few and far between at the time. And they had just distributed compact desk pros to every partner and every employee, actually partner, actually, at first, in the New York office. And so I got an internship working for Phil Laskaway, who was then the managing partner of the New York office. He ended up being the worldwide chair. And I spent a year building a basically LinkedIn for New York. So we took a relational database of every fortune, what ended up being 12, 5th, top 1,250 fortune companies whose headquarters were in New York. And we had 20, 30 people working for about six months. That's probably exaggerating. One conference room full of people working for six to nine months every day, researching who's who, Dun & Bradstreet, Stan & Poor, to put into a database all the information about the board of directors and the officers. And then I went around and interviewed every partner, and I got the same information. What country club you belong to, what other boards you sit on, what school did you go to? And we could do a lookup. If Gulf and Western was switching auditors, we could find out who we knew on the board of directors. It was really cool. Wow. And this was all yeah. for EY's business development? New, New York office, yeah. New York. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Phil Lasseway was way, way, way ahead of his time. My gosh. And 
And so that was fun. And I got to pick and choose what jobs I wanted to go on and what partners I wanted to work on when I moved into audit. And I, you know, my parents are from Ireland. They're both off the boat. My mother was a farmer from the poorest county in Ireland, down La Glera, County Leitrim, Annie Gilrain, Anna Gilrain. And so I learned my frugality from her, which is critical as an entrepreneur and my hard work. But I then decided that I wanted to be international because my mom would take us to Ireland, you know, a lot of summers. And so I know all my cousins over there and got us out at Flushing, New York. Queens in the city isn't a fun place to be if you're, you know, three young kids. So I went into international banking and learned how FX works and, you know, the financial industry, Wall Street clients and big banking clients and ended up after doing that for a couple of years going into after I got my two years of audit, I didn't want to be an auditor. I wanted to be a consultant. I wanted to be an advisor. So I moved over to the consulting group and I became a manager of accounting systems design after about two, three years, more on top of my three years in audit. And I designed accounting systems for MasterCard, Beckton, Dickinson, oh, giant New York clients of Ernst and learned how integrated ERP systems worked and so international ERP systems and how supply chain and automated billing and collections and cash management and all that kind of stuff. Because I was a CPA and I was the only CPA manager in our group, the other managers weren't CPAs, I got branded as the internal controls guy, which was awesome. So I learned to be an expert in internal controls and separation of duties, and which has served me well in the client accounting services world later on. I did that for four years, for a total of seven at Ernst, and I really enjoyed building systems. I knew that, and I loved learning project management, client management, more importantly, people management at Ernst & Young. I told my staff this today, we were in a training, and I talked about how much we invest in our training and why you know, we forecast lower utilizations than most firms because we're investing in their career paths because I stayed at Ernst & Young for seven years, and every year I learned and learned and learned. But I, I liked small business. I had grown this little thing on the side with my friends, probably had about four or five subcontractors, and I had enough so I could leave and start my own small CPA firm. And I had a little brownstone in Hoboken, New Jersey. I took the front bedroom on the ground floor, turned it into a CPA business, and quickly got to six employees because it was the Reagan years. 1983 is my guess. And I'm a salesman, I found. And I was helping businesses get something they wanted, but they weren't getting from their traditional CPA firm, which was helping them look forward, not just backwards. So I was able to steal big accounts from big CPA firms. And I found that their books were a mess. QuickBooks didn't exist then. Real world accounting software was our system of choice, as well as a couple of other big ones. Open source was big, but their data was a mess and they weren't going to pay me to clean it up. And without accurate data, we couldn't do the advisory services. So I got frustrated. I actually tried to have my bookkeepers who were in my home office log into my clients' computers. And I went as far as getting dedicated phone lines and 9,600 board modems, which was state of the art, and it was just too much latency. So I gave up on the CPA firm, turned it over to one of my college roommates, one of the guys who was a subcontractor. He was ready to leave Merrill Lynch. And so he kept my clients happy. And I joined one of my clients was a nonprofit no, organization called Amnesty International. And I ended up coming on as the CFO of Amnesty International USA. And oh, 1986 is what I'm guessing. I was 26 years old and I had been a volunteer for Amnesty for three years. All my weekends were spent and not all my weekends, but a lot of weekends and all my Fridays were spent with the high school students in the New York, New Jersey and Connecticut area. And, you know, I had question authority sticker in my office at Ernst & Young and I would leave every Friday at two o'clock and HR came in one day and said, you have to take that question authority sticker down. And I said, you'll have to take it down. Otherwise, I wouldn't be questioning authority, would I? And she didn't <laughs> take it down. <laughs> my partner said, leave him alone. He's my best manager is exactly what he told HR. So... I was on the program side for years and, you know, never dealt with the business side. And then Amnesty grew from $6 million to $18 million in a year and a half. This is an interesting story. Jack Healy, who's the executive director, Father Jack, got you two to do the Conspiracy of Hope Tour. And Sting, Peter Gabriel, used to endure, Tracy Chapman, you know, they did a United States wide tour at the height, like the same year as Live Aid. Right when MTV hit the scene, Jack oh. was there. Two Irish brothers, Bono and Edge and Jack Healy, three of them together, 
brought this program and Amnesty literally grew from six million. And then with Bruce Springsteen doing a human rights to now tour to a year or two later worldwide, we grew to 18 million. And Ernst and Young, this is a God story. I'm a very religious Irish Catholic here. And I got a call while I was at Ernst, my last week there, one of my last weeks there asking if from an audit partner that I worked for saying that he just picked up Amnesty International as an account and they need a new accounting system. And could I go meet with them? That's how I got introduced to Amnesty International as a client. Isn't that crazy? Wow. That's... What are the gods of that? <laughs> God is good. <laughs> God is good. Wow. So I went in there and it was crazy. The woman who was the official title is Deputy Executive Director of Finance and Administration, meaning there's an Executive Director, Jack Healy, and two Deputy Executive Directors. We didn't have badges, but I felt like I earned a badge. And I was in charge of anything that was not related to human rights. So HR, finance, IT, facilities, and fundraising. And I turned out that was my favorite part. So I spent four years there, and what I learned at Amnesty International was management accounting. My entire career was financial accounting, delivering financial statements as opposed to management reports. What I learned was how to design an accounting system that we had designed accounting systems for years, but we hadn't focused on, I hadn't, at least in my role, wasn't on budget versus actual. And that was what I quickly learned was critical for a nonprofit and cash flow management. So those two things really formed me more than Ernst & Young did because now all of a sudden, instead of writing reports to keep the IRS happy or the auditors happy, which is how I grew up, I was now trying to help budget managers and in this case, human rights activists to be able to make decisions in the field, knowing exactly how much money they had to spend. And then being able to take those reports and feed them back to the donors and show them where their money went show them the return on investment and the board of directors to be able to look at a budget and to be able to approve something knowing that they were prioritizing their limited resources on the things that would create, and this is the cool part, the most outcomes per dollar, meaning looking at where is success. When our mission is to stop torture, where do we get the biggest ROI on that? Is it the refugee program? And so we did zero-based budgeting. In fact, in my office, I don't have too many things hanging up, but the one thing I'm most proud of is uh, Jessica Newarth, who was chief legal counsel at the time, gave me a framed copy of the Nobel Peace Prize that Amnesty International was awarded because I, <laughs> I got the Nobel Peace Prize for finance for teaching human rights activists how to do zero-based budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. I enjoyed that slept on a lot of people's couches because we didn't have any money for hotels. And I would go out in the field and help the local grassroots activists raise money. And at 33 years old, I started there when I was 29. That's right. When I was 33 years old, after four years of CFO, the systems were, the accounting system was changed. The budgeting system was changed. The HR system was changed. We had a personnel policy committee. We upgraded from typewriters to networks, computers. I was on the Worldwide Computer Communications Working Group. Uh, as the American member of the CCWG, I had a lot of input because Apple was here, and they were really good friends of ours. And so they gave us a lot of resources to build a worldwide network. So we used technology to help people around the world who were getting tortured to get messages out to embassies. It was a wild, crazy time. But I thought, you know, 33 years old, I'm ready to be the boss. Of I course. Wish, yeah, yep, right? A coming-of-age story. <laughs> And I went to Jack Healy, my boss, and said, I'm ready to be a CEO of a nonprofit. And he said, you need to learn how to raise money. I said, I'm an accountant. I don't know. He goes, I've seen you speak. You can raise money. You're passionate about this. It's all taken. Three weeks later, D. Urchikel was our director of development. She reported to me. I recruited her. She called me up and said, I have to leave. Diane Feinstein has decided to run for Senate, and she wants me on her campaign. i got to go back to Diane. Because I got her when Diane dropped out of politics. She came to work for me. So all of a sudden, I'm the director of development, deputy executive director of development, so I don't get a demotion. And I have to go put on a suit and tie and go to rich people and ask them for six-figure gifts. I loved it. It was so much fun to go in and because I, I learned from the best professionals how to walk in and to say, Anne, thank you so much for letting me come to see you. I'm here to talk to you about what it will take for you to give a $500,000 contribution for our work on China. Now, let me show you what we're doing in China. And then just start telling the stories. And we went from 18.5 to about 20, just over 20 million by diversifying this major donor program and foundation program. And Marjorie Farmer saved my one year on her estate grant of 1.4 million. Thanks to her, we never missed 
in all my years of fundraising, never missed plan. But I was in a, after three years, it's hard to go back to the same donors and say, and I want to talk to you about what it takes for you to give $600,000 for our work on China when, you know what, I'm not sure I can quantify the ROI in China. And I'm an accountant. I got to be a CPA for a reason. I love it. I'm passionate about it. And in 1995, I got a call from Apple and he said, I need to show you something. I want you to go on to BitNet, which was the network that we were all connected to, and download this app feeds into BitNet. It's called a browser. And I saw Netscape 1.0. And I immediately realized that was the wide area network that I needed in order to deliver that outsourced accounting department. Because in Hoboken, New Jersey, as a CPA, I was thinking, wow, oh, if I could, if somebody could just deliver me accurate financial statements, organize the way I want to organize it on time and give me access to the work papers behind the balance sheet schedules, then I can bill out $175 an hour like I was at Ernst & Young and be the trusted advisor. Instead, I'm billing $45 an hour because it's my name on the sales tax return. And it's so difficult to find and attract talented bookkeepers, especially in small firms. So I had this idea for a company called Virtual Growth. I gave Amnesty six months notice. It was perfect timing because I had just finished the written development plan and I'm a builder. And so I didn't want to go back and do the same thing. So I, I left right when New York City was going through what's now was called Silicon Alley. It was basically from the Soho warehouses where artists languished with low pay in unair conditioned lofts doing graphic design suddenly found themselves in high demand because they understood HTML. And Madison Avenue in 1995 figured out that the web could be an advertising medium that they knew nothing about. And all of a sudden, there were a rash of highly successful companies like DoubleClick that were sprouting out of these warehouses, and we were there to be their accounting department. And we built it on a QuickBooks platform, and I did guerrilla marketing at every Jupiter event, every New York New Media cyber event. The verse, I was there at the very beginning, so I was on the circle line while I still worked for Amnesty International, meeting the founders of the New York New Media Association and being part of that group. They embraced us, and I became the accountant for all their little businesses. And the next thing you know, we've got a real business here, but it can't scale because QuickBooks wasn't scalable. So in 1998, I raised a million dollars of friends and family money, Uncle Carl LeBou being the anchor, and Chelsea Capital contributing quarter million dollars each. And then the rest of it, friends and family, to round out a million bucks. And we did a, I used my Ernst & Young accounting systems expertise to do a software selection process to build a scalable web-based accounting system because emailing QuickBooks files back and forth didn't work. There was no accountant's copy. There was no web. And we went as far as a process guy. We went as far as putting, you know, red light, green light on the client's copy of the QuickBooks file. If it was our day to process your bookkeeping, you could not touch QuickBooks. Well, guess what? The CEO comes in and says, I need an invoice for $50,000 right now. You do it. And we had version control problems. So we built this virtual accountant. We ended up on Lawson Software because it was in the first end-tier architecture system, which meant that you could build a web front end that could feed into the database. And we brought on Chase as a partner. We spent a million dollars with them building what's now their double approval on e-payments. We had an online bill payment service that we built, and Chase was the back end, and we needed second-level approval so a bookkeeper could enter it and a CEO could approve it. Chase, we paid them a couple million bucks. They built it for us. We licensed it. And a whole document management system, which is what Expensify and Expensables grew up to be. It was a great business. We grew to about 235 people and seven cities. And Insperity was one of our investors. Paul Savardi was on my board. He became my mentor. When he would come to New York, I would go down to the Mariana Wall Street and have breakfast. And my mindset became, what would Paul do? And we texted and emailed and called on a regular basis and became good friends and I understood his business strategy. And after September 11th, the economy in New York tanked and Citibank shut down their venture capital arm. They were our lead investor. Bessemer was the most money, but they were in because Citibank was in. So we had tier one Sand Hill Road VC firms, which opened up a lot of doors. And after September 11th, Citibank got shut down and the house of cards fell in. And basically in Sperity now, and Ministaff then was able to pick this up for a song. And basically, Paul said, if you move to Kingwood, I'll buy your company. 
And I asked him why. He says, I believe in you. I think that you'll go around, over, or through any walls that will come up in your vision. And somebody is going to build a billion-dollar client accounting services business. And I want to do it with you. And so I moved to Kingwood, became president of Administaff Financial Management Services. Did that for a couple of years. After September 11th, the economy still was hurting. Health insurance costs went through the roof. Administaff had a lawsuit with Aetna that some bad analyst, Morgan Stanley, said in Purdy will likely lose, and the stock went to $1.99. Ooh. Well, luckily, Insperity didn't have a chance of losing, and their stock took off. But it's not before we got bored, and I said to Paul, I got to call the question. Technology's changing. I got to sell. And Wall Street said, no, you can't diversify and outsource accounting. Focus on the PEO model. So we spun off Growth Force as a partner with Insperity later on, and I became a CEO of Growth Force as a no venture capital, no partners, just management team, brought back some old virtual growth people, and started Growth Force for the QuickBooks market because Lawson was a great tool, but the target market we're going after, which is into its core market, 80% of them were using QuickBooks. And so we went back to our basis and became one of the top QuickBooks counting system consultants. We built a methodology around data-driven decisions, how to work backwards from the decisions you got to make to make more money, to increase profits, and create a management reporting system to help you figure out pricing when to hire and fire people or fire clients, how do you spend money to make money by using the management accounting expertise from the nonprofit in the for-profit and being able to show clients which marketing campaigns generate the most profits, which of your teams contribute the most to profit, so you can figure out how to recruit more like them. And Growth Force's unique positioning is because of this, the relationship with Insperity is that deep accounting, management accounting, reporting systems expertise combined with this amazing human capital strategy offering. And so we became a beta customer for everything that Insperity does so I could learn how it works. And that's what we use to shape, make growth force a highly successful company. That single biggest lesson that I learned from my years at Insperity from working for Paul Savardi was culture eats strategy for lunch. We didn't have a great culture at Virtual Growth. We had a good business, 235 people in seven cities and blue chip venture capitalists and 43 million in venture capital total raise. But I turned around one day and I looked and there were bosses who were mean. They were jerks. And I remember thinking and saying to some of my founders, what happened to us? Who are we? This isn't the company I wanted to start. And it was passion. We worked hard, but we worked till 10 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night. You know, that's New York, especially Silicon Alley. And financial industry, Wall Street. So I changed that when I got to do this for the third time with virtual growth. So I, we were the very first client accounting services in 1995. Step two was administrative financial management services for three years. And then now the third iteration is virtual growth, which means I had the opportunity to, to make all these mistakes and get it right. And the biggest mistake was about not understanding employee engagement and culture. Because if you can create a great place where people stay for a long time, you make a lot more money. And that's why we do accounting. You know, that's one thing my dad also taught me. Why do you do that? To help increase the bottom line. So that's where we are. There's the story, Mark. (laughs) Wow. So just to be real specific, what does Growth Force look like today, employee-wise, specialties? So we do four things really well. Okay. We do systems optimization. So we take your back office and automate all the processes. We streamline, we integrate, and we document and train people on the growth force systems development methodology, which we call our smart back office. It's a QuickBooks-centric ecosystem where we have integrated the entire food chain of wherever financial data exists in electronic form, we can bring it into QuickBooks desktop or QuickBooks online. And the idea here is that you can start as a business life cycle. You can start with just the QuickBooks systems work. So we've got clients that all they did was they came in and we tuned up their systems and we built our smart back office for them and we trained their staff. And then we hope clients will say, all right, can you take over pieces of my functions that are cheaper for you to do it and they'll be done better and on time, like a month and close. I don't have to hire a controller. I can use my office manager or my accountant. And you guys can put a system in place, supervise my team for me, and I get a 30, 40% cost saving and a better result. So that's the first part of what we do. And we have 10 people in an onboarding department that are QuickBooks Advanced Certified and Gurus and Bill.com, T-Sheet, Expensify, Expensable. We have a whole ebook series, and there's one on our smart back office. 
and we deliver dashboards. We deliver customized dashboards for you to be able to make data-driven decisions. We do the regular financial reports, of course, that you need for the bank and the IRS. That comes automatic, but we also give you actionable financial intelligence, meaning if you have to make decisions, we're going to work backwards from there and build a custom scorecard to help you have the data to figure out the most important decision, for example, are you pricing your jobs right? So we use accounting, we use management accounting to look at gross profit and our smart back office to automate time-driven activity-based costing, TDABC in the accounting vernacular. So what we're doing is we are letting people capture time on their iPhones or their iPads or, you know, through their GPS chip. They don't even have to log in. You can just put on location, off location. And then when you pay the payroll, automatically use that timesheet data to allocate your fully loaded labor costs for your payroll, your health insurance, your taxes, your 401k, everything, retirement, recruiting, and take that fully loaded labor cost and divide it by the number of hours worked and then charge that rate per hour to each customer, to each job, to each service item, and each department that they work in. What that gives me is profitability by customer and profitability by job, by product or service line, or profitability by whatever way you've structured your company. Like Chief Outsiders is a client of ours, right? Here's a good story. We set up their QuickBooks file when Art started Chief Outsiders. It's like, I just, I don't have any clients, but I know I'm going to need QuickBooks. He heard Growth Force was, had a special management accounting system and he knew he was aspirational. He wanted to grow. So he chose us to design the QuickBooks system. And then As with every entrepreneur, we tell them, you need to spend as little money on accounting as possible until you have clients, until you have profits, and then follow a raging incrementalist approach. (laughs) Mark, you've never heard anybody talk about accounting that way, right? No. (laughs) Step by step, build the infrastructure at the stage that you need. So he came back to us when he was doing the billing himself, and he made a $17,000 mistake, and he had to eat it, and his partner said, you got to outsource this. And so he turned over billing. And then we said to him, you also need to turn over collections to us because here's how we do collections. I got a chance to be an Inc. 500 speaker for two years. And huh. it was fun. I, I did it one year and they invited me back, which is really nice. Um, what does that entail? It was, I created a topic of how to improve cash flow. I, I think it was like six steps to improve cash flow. That was my session. And what I did was I hired an intern from NYU grad school And I sent him off to the library, the New York City Public Business Library on Grand Central Station over by Grand Central on Lexington Avenue. And for six months, I had him do research on what is the best practices in the Fortune 500 companies, because that's where I grew up. And I saw what they did at Ernst & Young. I designed the systems and I said, go write that up. I want you to take that and turn it into something for small business. And that became my session. Fortune 500 best practices applied to small business. And the single best lesson of that, I got an ebook on that, CEO's Guide to Improving Cash Flow. Though all, this is, all these are in there. But the single best one we did for Art Sachs to be a chief outsiders was we said, Art, here's what you need to do. Don't have us just do the billing. Have us do the collections and put us in your contract with the clients and tell them that when they sign this contract, the very first call they're going to get is from Growth Force, your outsourced accounting department. And that collections call is not a collections call at all. It's a customer service call. And you say, hi, I'm Kyle from Growth Force, and I'm going to be your liaison for all things financial related to Chief Outsiders. So this is a call to find out what makes it easy for you to pay our bill. It's due on the 15th of the month. Here's the day we're going to send it out. What's the best process to follow? Who do we send it to? Who has to approve it? What supporting documentation do they need? Is there a particular day or time of the week that they will be looking at this every month? Is there a method that is the best way for us to get it to you? Do you want it by fax, by mail, by email? And if we're not getting payment when we expect, both expect to get payment, who should I call? And it's really great. Professional, it makes chief outsiders look really big. And what happens is we have a tool called Funding Gate that we use, which is a dashboard for collections. And we put all these things that we get the client to commit to, and we automate all those steps. The invoice goes out on the day in the format it's supposed to to the person it's supposed to go to with the supporting information. And that it goes from QuickBooks, and it syncs with Funding Gate to show when it went out. And then the rules kick in. If we're supposed to get payment by ACH on the 10th and we didn't get paid on the 10th, we call on the 10th. We're not calling on the 11th. We're not calling 30 days later. We're calling and say, hey, we talked about ACHS on the test. Is everything okay? This is a customer service call to make sure that you're happy with our services, that you have all the information that you need. 
and there's nothing that I can't do to make sure that you're taken care of. It's not a collections call, it's a customer service call. So that's what Growth Forces leads to Growth Forces' second service, so smart back office and our systems optimization is first. Our second is our cash flow improved services. So we do billing, we do collections, we do expense management through Expensable or Expensify. We do cash flow forecast where we help you figure out how much cash you need and help make sure you avoid those problems that cause businesses to fail. Third area we do is profit improvement. We help businesses make more money. We help improve their bottom line by giving them data-driven, actionable financials to make data-driven decisions. And there's five decisions they have to make. I've learned this. This is a fun fact. Pricing is number one. Spending money to make money is number two. Where do you get your biggest ROI? And if you're a nonprofit, How do you show your donors where you spent their money so you can get them to give you more money? Number three, hiring and firing. Both employees, because it's an expensive thing to step up your payroll costs, and hiring and firing clients, because businesses should be firing their bottom 15% and placing them with new, better-priced clients. That's the fastest way to profit. The fifth is, how do you cut costs? And that's what most people think of. If I want to increase profits, I need to cut my health insurance. I need to spend less money on marketing. Instead, you want to do is you want to increase your prices or you want to know which marketing spend gives you the biggest ROI and cut the lowest ROI. And that's our profit improvement services. And it's all done through bookkeeping, accounting, and controller services. We're a fractional share of an accounting department. It's probably what I should have said at the beginning, but I assume you know that as a client accounting services agency, that's what we are. And then the final thing we do is we help you lower risk. We help the business owner sleep at night, have peace of mind. We do that through separations of duties, and we make sure that there are three different roles that need to be happening on every single transaction. You know, those of you experts on systems and control know that one person has to authorize the transaction, another person has to record the transaction, and a third person has to wreck the asset, the custody or asset. And so we have a bookkeeper, a staff, and a controller assigned to every client. We separate the duties so that the owner knows that checks and balances are in place. So that's what we do. Does that answer your question, Mark? <laughs> yes. No, that's interesting. Wow. You know, I want to get to the final questions, but I, one thing I'm curious about before we do that, so this has been an amazing story, but if I call you five years from now and your career has went the way you want it to go, what does that look like? What does success look like for you? What does success look like? Yeah, well, in the future. Where are you going from here? So that's different from where am I going because success is what I'm doing right now. This is, and that's living the dream, right? You know, I'll give a promotion for Scaling New Heights. This comes out probably after Scaling New Heights. I'm speaking in two weeks in Atlanta, and I'm doing a session, two-hour session called Living the Dream. What I talk about is my story like that, you know, how I started virtual growth because I wanted to coach my kids' team. My dad was really busy as an entrepreneur and as an auditor when I was really young and trying to learn how to shoot a basketball. He was a traveling auditor. He was going off to Delaware and, you know, being away a lot. And so I vowed when I grew up, I was going to be really involved and coach their games and live 15 minutes away from my home. And so that's what we got. I'm in a hammock right now. It's uh, 3.55 on Friday, and I'm usually in my livable forest. I live in Kingwood, Texas, in absolutely paradise on earth. It's called a livable forest. I literally live in a forest. And for a boy from Queens, this was a lifelong dream, right? This is what I dreamt of. And so I'm in my garden at 5 o'clock, 5.30 the latest. And it gets dark here at 8. So, And I coached every sport my kids were in. And, you know, drive them and pick them up to dance. And now my son is a, you know, drummer in a rock and roll band. And I'm here to help to set up the garage for the garage band. You know, just actively involved in their lives. So that's mm-hmm. success. But what am I going to do in five years? Well, I hope more of the same. But, you know, I want to build a billion-dollar business. I think that this is a massive opportunity. And the way we want to do it is by partnering with CPA firms and bookkeeping service bureaus to help them fill in the holes in their staffing model. Meaning, you know, when I was a CPA, I had some good bookkeepers. But what I needed was a controller. because, And I see that with a lot of our affiliate partners. You know, we have an affiliate program where we work for the CPA firm or for the bookkeeping service. They are the client, not the client's client. We build the CPA, and the CPA bills their client. You can mark it up whatever way you want. We have a 10% discount for as long as that CPA or is bookkeeper or, or any affiliate, outsource CFO, anybody, is involved and active on the account. They play a valuable role to us, and that's 10% for as long as they're involved or 5% for life after the first year. 
And But more importantly, what we do is we give them the financial intelligence so they can be a trusted advisor. So they can help the clients make more money. That's what I'm hoping is the next phase for growth force, become a resource for the accounting industry. That's why, you know, you know me from the Houston CPA Society. I chaired the strategic planning committee for two years that we shepherded through our first, you know, real strategic plan. And we have a staffing problem. There's not enough knowledge workers in accounting to do the work that needs to get done. That's why I'm so passionate about honors accounting in high school, because people are graduating with accounting degrees, but they're not taking the CPA exam. And so the one piece of advice that I would have for anybody who was nice enough to listen to this whole story was that you got to get your CPA. It's a game changer. I would never have gotten my job as a chief financial officer of Amnesty International at age 29 if I wasn't a CPA. That gave the board instant credibility. And it has opened doors my whole life. And my father said, if you have a CPA or you really understand how to read a financial statement, the language of business, you'll have a head up on everybody else that you're competing with for promotions. There you go. That's kind of my final thought, I guess. I have three questions, yeah, that I end every podcast with. And I know we're running up against time here. So short answers are okay if you know, or you can expand, whatever works with your schedule. Okay. First one is, what's been your proudest moment career-wise? Well, that's a great question. That's easy. I know that. It's the day, I still get emotional about it. It's the day I called my dad and told him I passed the CPA exam. Oh. No doubt. That's a special moment in life. That is neat. Well, the second question, tell us about a mistake you made and what you learned from it, of course. But the bigger, the better. <laughs> oh. We like the big mistakes. Okay. All right. So I've made some colossal mistakes. $43 million in venture capital is a lot of spending, which means you can try a lot of things. And if it fails, that's okay. Just fail fast. Learn from it. Move on. And so of the biggest of all of those, I would say, if you're going to accept outside capital, make sure you only have to go to the well once. Meaning the venture capitalists were great. Jeannie Sullivan at Starvest Partners in particular, I want to give a shout out to because I love that woman and I would do business with her anytime. But once the big boys came in, what happened was we had a business plan and we said we need $5 million to execute against this plan. Mark Sawicki, my CFO, said let's raise 10 so we have more than we need because we don't want to get to a dilution a second time. And the reason you don't want that second dilution is because they have you over a barrel. That's when they become vulture capital. You have what I learned what they institute a mandatory new clause called a double dip, which means that as soon as we got there, we went up to raise 10 million and we put 12 in the bank and we stopped. And then at the first board meeting, I remember Jeannie Sullivan saying to me, Stephen, we didn't give you $12 million to keep it in the bank. We want you to spend it. We want you to grow faster. We want you to build out your software development team. We want you to build out the sales force, channels, business development managers all across the country. And we got our burn up to a million dollars a month at their direction. And what I didn't realize, I was, how old was I? I was 35 years old. <laughs> I'm just coming out of a nonprofit, right? So I was in a completely different world for seven years before. And of course, you know, you do what the board says. Even though I had control of the board, you know, I'm excited. And what they said was there's plenty of money where that came from. And a year later, they were right. I got another $12 million. But what happened was it comes with a double dip, which means that they claw back their $12 million first, and then they get to participate equally with that $12 million again, pari passu, meaning Ooh. equal among equal. Anybody else who invested in round two now has their percentage distribution. The double dip will kill you. The clawbacks will kill you. They get all their money out first before you get a dime. It's like rock and roll. I did say, I do, I'd say one of my other proud moments is I got a call from Andy Bergman, who's a senior manager of Pricewaterhouse, a friend of mine. He was president of the dorm council. I was vice president. And as part of being the chief financial officer of Amnesty International, it also meant I became treasurer of Concerts for Human Rights. So the 501c3 organization that Bruce and Sting and Peter Gabriel, and I got to meet all those guys, which is a great, I could tell that story. That'd be a fun podcast. Bruce Springsteen, I mean, you two are backstage with Peter Gabriel at Madison Square Garden. They said on my announcement card, which we mailed out, said I have now become Deputy Executive Director of Finance Administration and Treasurer for Concerts for Human Rights. And he sent me a congratulation, says, you did it. You've become a rock and roll accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was proud. That was fun. 
I was hoping we were going to circle back around to that somehow. I was trying to fit it in there, and we did. So, you know. yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, you've shared so much. I hate to skip the last question, but if there's nothing else I understand, we usually end it on before we close down. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received, You know that you have ever been told? I'll repeat it because it's, it's worth repeating, Mark. So thanks for mentioning that. Culture eats strategy for lunch. And I'll, I'll drill into that a little bit. Culture is a word that's often misused. Michelle Michael, who's the smartest brain at Insperity, in my opinion, on the human capital side anyway, talks about how it's everything you do. It's how people speak to each other. It's where you park. It's the, you know, trust in meetings. Uh, do, are people willing to speak out against the boss? If you say you have a teamwork environment, is it really a teamwork environment or do you have to copy your boss on any email that goes to her boss? Do you have to run anything you want to run through your boss to your boss first before you can talk to the boss's boss? That's not teamwork. That's not trust. And so what I learned, and I learned it by doing it, when I came from virtual growth, I was the CEO. I didn't know anything about human capital strategy. I had some great HR people, but I didn't listen to them because they didn't help me sell and they didn't help me serve my clients. At least I didn't understand how a human capital strategy helped me serve my clients. And what I learned when I worked for Paul and I figured out what Insperity, how to unleash Insperity's power and then became a client again for the second time was that by taking the time to define your business strategy, what is it makes you unique? What is the core competency of this company. And I have this in an ebook called Five Steps to Profitability is our CEO's guide to profitability on our website, growthforce.com slash resources. The second is a people strategy and how people drive profits, how to change recruiting to recruit for cultural fit and behaviors, not skills to pay the bill. Digging that a little bit further. I would recruit for bookkeepers and I would have my executive assistant who previous HR job was she was a waitress at the Cheesecake Factory. She was also in charge of IT facilities, HR, everything there was because we were only five people. And Erica Milburn was my right hand. And so she'd take the resumes and circle QuickBooks and circle accounting degree and circle those who worked for CPA firm. And they were a terrible team. They didn't fit. It was not what Insperity taught me to do. And culturally was to study the behaviors that are successful in our business. And which employee is the most productive? And Marcia Gibb is that person. And everybody in my company knows this story. She's now our director of onboarding 11 years later. She was a bookkeeper who was going to school at night at Lone Star College. And what I did was we studied what Marcia did that made her so great. And we documented that as our core value. And what we found was Marcia was passionate about accounting. She was a problem solver. She was a team player. She would walk around every morning at nine o'clock when she got hungry and say, what are we doing for lunch? What do you think? Chinese? We had Mexican yesterday. Which Chinese place? You want the one? You like the the Hunan Garden, right? (laughs) That created a culture of teamwork. And she was, she had snap. If she needed to figure something out in QuickBooks, she would Google it. She would YouTube it. She would play. She would create a fake QuickBooks file and figure it out. And she was accountable. If we asked her to do something and she couldn't do it, she was at your door saying, I can't do this by Friday. You gave me six other things. Which one do you want done first? So now when we recruit, we recruit for behaviors and cultural things. Teresa Jones, our HR manager, does the first interview. She's not an accountant. She's a certified human resource management professional. She's looking, she's asking questions that are situational to talk about. Tell me a situation where you had to deliver on a project and your boss gave you too many things to do. And you knew that one of the projects that you needed by Friday, five o'clock wasn't going to get done. And it was Tuesday. And you realized that, what would you do? And we want to see, it was like, I go right to his door and say, hey, boss, tell me what's a higher priority because it's not doable. Recruiting for behavior was the single biggest difference because now we have 6% on turnover. The accounting industry averages 21%. Small business average is 19%. That doesn't mean one in five people leave. It's the same 40% of the jobs out of 100% turnover usually. But when you limit that down, your profits go through the roof. Your clients are happy if your employees are happy. So and employees are happy if following Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if they're feeling loved, if they belong to a team, if they're given opportunities to grow and to learn, if they're recruited for the right behaviors, then they'll have self-actualization, meaning their highest purpose is what they love is accounting. They will love to come to work every day and do more accounting and try more KPIs and 
you know, we deliver web-based KPIs and we're starting to roll out new tools where our staff are going to have different conversations, more like CFO conversations with our clients. That gets the people that we recruit excited because when they wake up in the morning, they're like, oh, we got this new KPI web tool I get to play with today instead of I got to go to work. So that's my culture, eat strategy for lunch. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. As much as we've talked about technology, culture is a good point to end this on. That's a good point. Thank you. Well, for our audience, this has been Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. If you haven't yet visited the website, please do so. You can find the show notes, of course, plus we have a little job board. We've got links to all the review courses you need for all the accounting certifications, really a lot of resources for accountants there. Stephen, What's the best way to contact you if somebody wanted more information about your books or, or about speaking engagements or Growth Force? What's the best way? It's absolutely the website. It's www.growthforce.com. My email is Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, at growthforce.com. And thanks for having me, Mark. This was fun. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you again to the audience for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come. <laughs>